let's begin so we were talking about how the demographic and urbanization pressures can lead to various kinds of inequalities in access to resources as i will show in the next or the next slide in developing countries like india the problem of environment is not only a problem of conservation it's also a problem of access to resources and therefore it is very important that we address the issue of equity and that is one of the reasons why it's put there in the ugc syllabus not everything about the ugc is bad okay so one is about the disparities in northern and southern so northern generally refers to the richer countries that's a social science term global north global south global north is europe north america and the rest of the world is the global south so this is referred to by ramchandra guha the environmental science sociologist as full stomach and empty belly environmentalism that there are certain countries and there are certain people and individuals and groups within our own countries who have what we were discussing during the break as full stomach uh, environmentalism where uh, tigers have become are more important than human beings so we don't say that tigers and human beings are both important for each other even if tigers eat up human beings and not the other way around but still there is certain certain kinds of conservation is given more importance than others so there is a narrow view of environment as only plants only animals and not as human beings dependent on animals for each other so for example uh, there is now increasing biological evidence that some amount of exploitation of forest is actually useful isn't it so for example if leaves and twigs and branches fall and nobody is there to pick them up they just pile up that can cause diseases for plants it can cause imbalances in the soil sunlight exposure is not there some insects can breed so human beings are part of nature and human beings by being part of nature have a role to play in environmental sustainability just as human beings have a role to play in environmental degradation okay so full stomach environmentalism is something that only looks at conservation and environment in terms of beauty and aesthetics and recreation and not as something on which millions of people depend every day for their living people like us are distanced from environment other people use the environment and give us things which we use but we don't directly depend on them okay but there are millions of people who depend directly and for them this empty belly environmentalism matters so there are two kinds of issues here which we should discuss in classes one is that people who are very poor may end up exploiting resources or may end up using resources in a suboptimal way either because they do not have awareness or because they do not have the appropriate technologies science or because there is no other choice to eat i have to use resources to live i have to use resources but empty belly environmentalism can also be of a different kind which is what is more important for us and we have to learn that people who have empty bellies know the importance of environment because today for us if crops fail in maharashtra because of the freak weather phenomenon and the onions have got destroyed i can always get onions from somewhere else it doesn't matter but where will those farmers go where will they get food from okay if i don't get alfonso mangoes i will get mangoes from somewhere else if i just cross the road across iit you know 10 years ago i used to get himachal apples now i get chinese apples australian apples american apples but not himachal apples okay so these people the people who directly depend on natural resources for their everyday life they know the importance of the environment for them and therefore they have worked out rules regulations mechanisms institutions to ensure they are maintained properly that aspect of governance of natural resources is also important because we usually focus on governance in terms of laws in terms of government policies in terms of international agreements but governance begins from below few people getting together to maintain a resource that is something that we also need to understand that is also part of intimidly environmentalism which we need to understand the urban rural equity issues is something i have covered earlier so these are related to resource transfers which enhance inequalities so um, you know one of my students is also doing research on um, in rajasthan for example where uh, rivers have been diverted 
to support mining industry, and therefore cities and villages are not getting water anymore because they can pay more for the same water. So these create a lot of inequalities. But since we've discussed it in detail, I won't go into it more. Uh, gender equity is also very important because very often we forget that on the one hand, men and women have different perspectives on natural resources because their dependence is different. Their role with reference to natural resources is different. Okay? And the impact of environmental degradation on women and men also different. So if, for example, there is a shortage of water, since in India mostly it is women who have to go to fetch water in villages, they have to travel many more kilometers to fetch water. There is a beautiful video, uh, a TED talk given by Professor Anil Gupta of IIM Abdabad. I'll uh, give you the link later. I was showing it in the other class yesterday. He shows this picture of for Rajasthan tourism of a woman working, walking across a desert with a pot on her head to fetch water. This is being used to promote tourism to Gujarat. Where nobody talks about the suffering of that woman who has to walk barefoot in a desert five kilometers to fetch water. Now, that is precisely what full stomach environmentalism is about. But that also tells us that it is women who are affected by increasing lack of access to certain resources like water because it is primarily women's duties to fill those. Or there is a lot of research by economists like Bina Agarwal who talk about uh, uh, the scarcity of fodder and fuel wood for example. So even now in many villages for cooking, household cooking, you depend on firewood. As forests degrade, women have to spend longer and longer time fetching firewood. So that means there is less time available for cooking, for taking care of children, for education, for all kinds of things. It affects the welfare of the family. Okay, so the burden of environmental degradation is felt by women differently from women. Okay, but women's attitudes also may, may be different. So uh, Vandana Shiva, how many of you know of Vandana Shiva? Okay, you people are not allowed to raise your hands. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about Vandana Shiva? Yeah, of she, she is a lifestyle activist. She uh, is actually, I don't, I, I, I don't know whether I should use the word against. Okay. But she um, does, uh, does not, uh, I mean, she is not favor of the agriculture the way it is uh, okay. going on. Yeah. Yeah. And especially uh, against the GMOs yes, yes. and bohemianly fighting against yes. that at the international level. Yeah. Um, so I think right now at this moment she is uh, more into GM, anti-GMOs okay. thing. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else wants to tell us about Vandana Shiva? Same thing. Okay. So Vandana Shiva is a physicist by training. Okay. But uh, she runs this organization called Navadanya in Dehradun, Uttarakhand. Uh, deals with environmental issues. So she's, as he said, works on the problems of highly chemicalized agriculture, GMOs, GM crops, but also on water issues on which she's done a lot of work. So she, along with another scholar called Maria Mies, wrote this famous book called Ecofeminism. So basically what this is trying to say is that women's attitudes to nature is somewhat different from that of men. And it may not be universal, it may not be generalized, but it is a perspective which we have to understand and respect that women have a better ethic, a better sense of caring and responsibility because they are trained to take care of children and sick people and elderly people at home, whereas men have other responsibilities due to the division of labor within the family. So the argument is that because men have been in control of decision making for a very long time in history, a particular attitude towards nature has developed where we think of nature as a resource to be exploited and used, whereas women think of natural resources or environment in more caring and responsible terms that they are there for use but not for over exploitation, not for profit making. Okay, so I am giving it a, in a very simple way but this is a broad perspective and it is very important because this is also a perspective that is emerged from India. So when we talk of environmental issues, very often the textbooks only give us foreign perspectives. So it's important to recognize that there are very significant issues, perspectives, theories that have come from within India, that our people are not just people who simply suffer from poverty and illiteracy and ignorance and problems of environmental degradation, we can also come up with ideas. 
that's also an important lesson which we should share with the students yeah but we should remember the contribution of medha patkar in narbada bachao yes, andolan yes, also yes yes thank you yeah yes. we do that yeah so so i think uh, Uh, Dr. Maya Mahajan mentioned where Medha. I don't have enough time here to go into every, but I think it's there in one of the slides. Of course, Medha Patkar is there uh, down below. Medha Patkar, a lot of other women. If you go back to Chipko, the Chipko movement, the women. I'll come to that. Even further back, you know, people like Mira Ben, Gandhi ji's disciple, who was played a very important role in the environmental movement, who was in fact an inspiration also for Chipko in some sense. Even before that, uh, recently. i looked at some archival records of uh, writings by sister nivedita who was a disciple of swami vivekananda she visited uttarakhand and she was writing about the environmental degradation in uttarakhand even in the 19th century you know very interesting stuff so somehow that's what we are trying to say that maybe you know because of the care giving role of women the nurturing role that they have they have a different attitude towards the environment but also because they have this primary role of providing certain services including water fire fuel wood firewood fodder for their cattle and so on and therefore a certain kind of attitude has emerged among women with reference to resources which is somewhat different from men who control the economy malwar from pichi is a basically a bsc degree agricultural graduate mm -hmm. he worked with the government for 10 or 15 years i think yes later uh, seeing the practices which goes on towards the green revolutions using yes. the chemicals he quit the job and he spent his lifetime he is no more now yeah. last year he, he passed away thank you he, he actually spent his life for the organic farming practice okay and uh, yesterday uh, afternoon we were yes. talking about the use of uh, urine cow yes. the panjagaviam is yes. is also one more uh, okay. thing he is he was recommending for that okay i want to make Yeah. this he is, has to be also included in that list yes. yeah there are lot of people of course in india yeah lot of people okay and we'll i'll mention more of them a little later but since you mentioned namarwar namarwar is also a famous saint one of the bhakti saints and like sant tukaram whom i mentioned in the beginning if you read some of namarwar's poems also you can see the uh, relationship with nature which is thought of in a very different way in and namarwar's uh, foster daughter andal also wrote a lot about nature so that's why we are trying to suggest that uh when it comes to environmental issues and you are addressing issues of equity and inequality there are different kinds of inequality which we try to address between the rich and the poor the urban and the rural and of course the gender issues so we will be uh, taking this up in more detail in the main course but and we will be supplying you material but uh, it's something that i think you as coordinators should be prepared for now one you know one should not uh, assume that the social approach the social science approach is only a very general common sensical understanding of the world around us because some many times people confuse social science with common sense so social science is also science like all other disciplines and there are terms and concepts and theories so introducing some of them is also good otherwise we fall we commit the mistake as professor fatak said yesterday of dividing the universe into different silos different compartments and different compartments have different kinds of value first class second class third class and so on so that's why we will also use certain concepts certain terms which and these are all college going students so we expect that they will also learn some terms and not just understand things in a very general or generic kind of sense so guha ramchandra guha and madhav gadgil in their book ecology and equity talk about three kinds of people with reference to inequality and environment in india so you all know what is omnivores we learn it in class 5 okay, omnivores carnivores herbivores so human beings are omnivores we eat everything okay even those which we cannot consume we eat okay we convert them into many different things and we eat we get them from very different places and eat okay and we consume them in many different ways using many different technologies in various kinds of environments so those groups that are identified there as are omnivores the second they call as the ecosystem people these are people who directly depend on resources for their livelihood which i have been stressing upon that is mostly the small farmers the landless labor and the nomadic pastoralists who graze livestock 
cattle, sheep, goats, those kind of people. Hmm? Tribal people, yeah. So what they are trying to say is that the first group, the omnivores, in their model of development, they bring more and more area under their control for factories, for power plants, for ports, for cities, housing, all kinds of things. And gradually, the second group of people are displaced from their land. They become ecological refugees, like you have war refugees, who come to the city and start living in the slums as urban poor. So you have three groups of people among whom there is inequality in access to resources. So what they suggest is that between the first and the second group of people, there are differences in terms of how much reach they have to access resources. So for example, I can buy apples from Australia and USA and uh, China also, whereas there are some people who cannot, do not have, cannot even eat food. Okay? So the reach of the resources, they can get resources from anywhere in the world. So there are some people who get caviar, from, for example, from Russia. Okay? So that's, it may cost how much? $1,000 per plate or something like that. There are people ready to pay for it. The nature of the economy is different. The subsistence purposes to meet your basic needs or to make profits. Whether they are rooted in their local cultures. So this section may see itself as modern scientific, but they may not be. Going back to your question, Dr. Mitra, that they may actually have studied in Wharton and Yale and all of that. But they, they, may, they see themselves as modern scientific, but they actually are not adopting a scientific approach to the environment because of the various issues, not seeing it in a holistic manner, as I said. Whereas the people who may be traditional, authentic, who may not have studied agriculture or modern sciences may actually have a more scientific approach. Like your Mr. Namarwar who has a BSc, for example. So just because somebody has a PhD in agriculture doesn't make that person a good farmer. These are the, the different kinds of classes. And they are separate from the resource base, which means that even if resources get exhausted in one part, they can still access resources from somewhere else. They don't feel the pinch as people who are directly dependent, like it happened with the recent heavy rains in parts of Maharashtra. Suddenly their whole life turned into a crisis because they lost all their crops. Okay. So because of this, what we say is that in developing countries or countries of the global south, it is not only conservation or protection of the environment that is an issue. From a social perspective, we are interested in conflicts. Why are there so many conflicts and so many different kinds of conflicts around resources in countries like India? You have water disputes between almost every state in India. Okay? You have everybody promising free water, nobody worrying about the consequence. Okay? There are struggles against mines and various other kinds of projects like POSCO. So the issue is, how do we understand environment from a social perspective if the primary issue is not conservation but conflicts? And why are there so many conflicts? Why are there so many struggles? And going back to what I mentioned in the beginning, you have to understand it with respect to particular periods when these became issues. So why, for example, there were conflicts over river water sharing between Punjab and Haryana at a particular point of time? Why Tamil Nadu and Karnataka now but not 50 years ago? There are reasons for that which we have to understand. And those reasons pertain to our use of resources. So the question is, here, the problem of struggle is related to all these things. Who owns resources? Who should own them? Who should manage them? What technology should be used? So the British, for example, when they came to India, they decided through the 1872 Forest Act that all forests belong to them. For centuries, people living in forests, it belonged to them. They had rights to manage them, which the rulers had given. And the government of India in 1947, in great wisdom, continued to follow that policy. Saying the forest belonged to the government of India, not to the people who live there. Which is why it leads to a lot of conflicts, because there are 120 million people who are directly dependent on forests, which is more than the population of many countries in the world. Obviously, if you ignore their interests, there is going to be struggle, there is going to be conflict, there is going to be violence. So it is a question of what kind of policies we follow with reference to creating access or disabling access to resources. Similarly with water. So 
the river water disputes are are related to the kinds of agriculture we practice so since the 60s after the green revolution was introduced we introduced varieties of crops which require more water so before the 60s this kind of conflicts didn't exist because farmers did not require so much water the varieties of rice and wheat we grew did not require so much water the new technologies require more water so why did we not do research in a different way for a country like india you don't need hybrids that you grow in america which can get plenty of water you need hybrids which are tolerant to drought which can grow in with less water but nobody does that kind of research okay so those are the kind of choices we made which leads to particular kinds of conflicts or this issue we were discussing uh, during the break who should manage who should own should it be the government should it be the private sector which is more efficient so during the break we were discussing that there are some environmentalists who think that forests and wildlife will be conserved if we keep human beings away from them we did that very successfully in sariska not a single tiger is left we removed the human beings along with them the tigers also left or they were killed off because human beings living next to the forest depending on the forest it is in their own interest to make sure the forest health is protected if tigers are there the entire ecosystem because tigers are at the top of the pyramid the entire ecosystem is maintained and if the ecosystem is maintained the people also can get something from the forest for their livelihoods but if people are not there there's nobody to see who is poaching the tigers nobody to ensure that the health of the forest is protected so this was a case of a massive failure of that particular ideology which thought that we should separate human beings from wildlife conservation and so somebody like valmik thapar who is entire life was arguing for separating human beings keeping them away finally changed his mind to a little bit to a little extent okay, after seeing that not a single tiger was left in sariska now they have to export tigers from somewhere else you know from gujarat and rajasthan and other places ranthambore okay yeah so that brings in the other question the last question there so how should resources be governed or managed because sometimes there is a feeling especially among educated people that people who are more educated people who are experts people who are scientists have the best ideas they can come up with the best schemes strategies solutions that's not true so poor people people without education also can come up with good schemes to manage the resource and that is something that we have to also impart through the educational system that's something that we we'll look at here so that products are also in the task force because our country needs with this tiger task force no task force so and so task forces you don't find a single one the 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 tribal or the yeah. Exactly. forest exactly who are actually living with them yes, yes. i can talk about kajiranga rhino as yeah. you know that yes. 2015 already four yes. or five already yeah. killed yeah yes yes i've been reading and, about that and it is going to be i think the ne yeah. next major issue after yeah. tiger yeah. but by that time rhinos will be vanished yeah. yeah and that that but these task forces which which uh, are prepared by various you know yeah. policy makers yeah. doesn't have a single person yeah. Yeah. from the forest yes that's a very good point in fact you know that that's a very general point also you know every year like last month the budget was presented by the finance minister every year before the budget the finance minister speaks to all the editors of economic newspapers speaks to the corporate leaders but doesn't speak to farmers doesn't speak to people living in the forest doesn't speak to you and me not doesn't even call academics like us okay so how are decisions made and why is it that people who have brilliant ideas about managing the resource are not part of these kinds of task forces or decision making that's that's what they are trying to say and therefore the question is which form of ownership which form of control is better for preventing resource depletion so the government in india can get away by not involving people because the government owns those resources okay what if that was not the case what even if government owns they see control of management of resource to people at the lower levels will it be more effective so there are some studies which show yes some studies which say no 
So there are different kinds of studies around the world which says uh, sometimes government is better, sometimes private sector is better, sometimes local people manage resources more efficiently. So it's a question of as somebody said earlier about population optimization. One solution will not work everywhere. We need to find out which solution works best for environmental, uh, efficient environmental management. So if you look at some of these issues for example, so these are, I have used a few examples here but you can multiply these examples depending on what your interest is, your teacher's interests are, your students interests are. And you can also choose things based on where you yourself are located. So if you are based in Nagpur for example or Vidarbha, you can look at issues related to forestry and mining in that region. If you are in Orissa, you can focus on those issues. So depending on where you are from, you can focus on issues which are relevant and which students there can relate to. So forest resources, we know there are huge conflicts in India because somehow whether it is God or it is nature or it is evolution, somehow in India all the mineral resources are located under forests. So you have to destroy forests to extract those minerals. So we say those minerals are important for national development, but then we don't consider those people living in forest to be nation. Okay? And because the law says that you can only give compensation if you show a patta showing that you own the land. And so people living in forest don't have a patta, so they can be displaced without giving compensation. There's no question of R&R, &R, relief and rehabilitation. So these are all the kind of issues that emerge. That is why there are so many conflicts around resources because of the way in which we have governed resources, we have developed policies, laws and so on. Same thing with water, there is excessive utilization, we are seeing floods again and again, we don't know how to manage them. Recently I saw this alarming statistic that India and Pakistan together extract so much of groundwater that it goes through the hydrological cycle to cause sea level rise. You can imagine how much of water is being pumped out, goes into the air and then goes into the ocean there. Okay? And that is partly because most states in India until very recently had no law about groundwater exploitation. No laws at all. Only recently they have laws. Kerala was the first to enact this law. Okay, after a big conflict about uh, Coca-Cola extracting a lot of water, Plashi Mada. Same thing, you know, mineral resources, if I can just give you an example. There was an NGO from Andhra called uh, Samata. So in 1990s, they filed a case saying that the local people who are living in a mining area should be made partners in a mining project. Their uh, consent should be taken and any benefit should be shared with them because historically they have been protecting that area. In 1999, this judgment came. The Supreme Court said within six months, you should organize a conference of chief ministers and implement this law, implement our judgment. So there are ways in which one can meet national goals and meet the goals of environment as well as local people. But because they are not being done in that way, there are more conflicts, more struggles. Okay? Similarly with human wildlife conflicts also. So on the one hand, it is a real problem to people, you know, elephants. So those who are from Amrita will know about the elephant problem. <laughs> okay? So the, and, uh, in IIT, of course, we have the leopard problem. Okay? So there are human wildlife conflicts are increasing, but we are not able to realize why these are increasing. Is it because we are encroaching on their space? Is it because they are not able to find enough prey there? Or is it because leopards want a degree from IIT? We don't know. We need more study. Okay? One can also use a range of case studies from different parts of India uh, to understand the environment society interactions as well as struggles and conflicts over environment. So these are all very famous case studies. There's plenty of books, materials, articles available. There are films, documentaries and all of these. The Chipko of course is the most famous which we all know. The Silent Valley in Kerala in the 1970s which is one of India's richest biodiversity hotspots. Okay? And interestingly, a lot of scientists from TIFR, from TISS, the Kerala Saitya Parishad was involved in it. Okay? They all documented. So there is a role for science here to explain why this is very important. Water conflicts. Plachimada is the famous case of uh, Coca-Cola in Kerala, which was exploiting a lot of groundwater. And then dams and multi-purpose project Narmada which was I think briefly mentioned earlier why there are so many conflicts. Again, Narmada is also related to rural urban conflicts because much of the water is diverted for rural urban drinking water purposes, less for agriculture. 
and very little for past dry areas like Kutch. So the government spends a lot of money but not equal benefits distributed to everybody. And also the issue of green revolution. Uh, again, there's a lot of material on what kind of inequalities is created, what kind of sustainability problems it created because of excessive use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides. So because of which now Punjab, which was once a prosperous state, now you have farmer suicides. Because yields are stagnating, the soils have been degraded so much. So uh, using a lot of video material, books, articles, actual interviews with Sundarlal, this is a very interesting uh, interview which you can see. Uh, one could talk about these movements. In this, for example, uh, Sundarlal Bahuguna talks about the difference between a temporary economy and a permanent economy. That if you exploit the forest only for employment and income generation, it's a temporary benefit. In a few years, there will be no forest. How do you use the forest in such a way that there is a permanent economy there? That's something he talks about. He also talks about the difference between men and women. The men wanted to cut the trees to make cricket bats. The women wanted the trees to remain because it uh, protects the soil from degrading, prevents floods, provides fodder for their animals. There was a conflict between men and women also. This half an hour documentary on the fence uh, is a documentary which was made recently, a few years ago, 40 years after the original Chipko movement in the early 1970s. And you have all the women who were very young at that time, between the age of 15 and 20, who participated in the movement. And they're talking about what kind of changes have happened or not happened now. The, the, the documentary starts by saying, call the Prime Minister here. A woman is saying, call the Prime Minister here. And then they say, everybody has benefited from uh, Chipko movement. The photographers, the cameramen, the politicians, the academics, the activists, nothing has changed for us. <laughs> okay, everybody has benefited from it. So, it talks about the entire history of that region, that it's not just about what happened in 1970, the history of degradation of Uttarakhand can be traced back to the British rule, you know, where they cut down a lot of forests for constructing railways, roads, all of those kind of things, and then up to the present moment. So there's a long history to that. Those are the women there, who are the original women who participated in the Chipko movement, you know, who dared the loggers to come and kill them, and they hugged the trees like this. There's a similar movement in Karnataka called Apiko. Some of you may have heard of it, Apiko. Apiko in Kannada means to hug. Pandurang Hegde, yeah. yeah. Uh, similarly, with the Forest Rights Act, I told you earlier about this Lekha Menda village in Garchiroli district of Maharashtra. This is the documentary, uh, which is made by the people of the village themselves. Uh, very, very interesting. Or about Anna Hazare. Today, many people know of Anna Hazare only as an anti corruption leader, but 20 years ago, he was famous for water management. He's still famous for water management in Ralegaon Siddhi, yeah, in Aurangabad district. Or this Hivre Bazaar uh, in uh, Popat Pawar, it is so famous that every day there are bus loads and car loads of people going there to see what is happening. Okay, so uh, these are all cases where one could talk about how communities manage to use laws, policies, governments, decentralization of power through panchayats, how these were used to uh, regain to reclaim land and rivers and water and forest and grassland which were degraded. So in this uh, video, Anna Hazari for example mentions that we could not have done this without panchayats because now we have the power to use the panchayat to decide our own policies, to make our own policies, to manage our own lands which was not possible before 1993. So people power is also important there and he also mentions how the same policy when it was implemented by the government of Maharashtra, failed. When, when they used the same money, it succeeded. This, of course, is the most famous. I won't talk about this in detail. I think it was mentioned yesterday, and all of you are familiar with it. There are many issues. You, have, you see uh, Medha Patkar there. But, you know, one of the things we usually don't talk about is the these three. So there's a fundamental failure of imagination with reference to Indian reality there. Because most of the projects claim that these are the four kinds of benefits that we can get. That's why dams are necessary. But then in the Indian context, they don't work that way. You know, the first multi-purpose project constructed in India was a Damodar Valley project. The primary purpose was flood control. That's where it has failed the most. Because in India, you find very often 
that floods are caused when dams release water. Okay? They are supposed to protect you from floods, they release water and then they cause floods. It happens with every dam in India. Kosi, Kosi of course happens because of the damage that Nepal does to us. Okay? So the inter-country cooperation is also important. Um, with Tungabhadra it happened and so on. So if you want to generate hydroelectric power, you need to maintain a certain level in the reservoir. As engineers, we all know that. If you want to maintain the reservoir level, you cannot let out water for irrigation. So obviously, you cannot do both. Okay? If there is excessive uh, rainfall, then you cannot store. You have to let out water. What also happens is that the most common problem in dams is siltation. 700 dams have been identified there for decommissioning. Australia is decommissioning all its dams. India and China are the only two countries which are constructing more dams. Because dams are economically not feasible. The cost of siltation over a period is so high that the benefits you get is less compared to the costs. Okay, this doesn't mean that dams are always bad. Medha Patkar, as you know, is only opposed to large dams, not to small check dams. Like somebody was talking about village tanks. In south of the Vindhyas, the traditional system of irrigation has always been village tanks which are the most efficient way of water management. Okay. So, people, they, one of our uh, alumnus, BTEX from uh, 80s, Sripad Dharmadikari and many others, they actually showed how you can meet all of these needs, all of these needs even in small dams. So, some of you may have seen the movie Swadesh. So, in Swadesh, they show um, a scene where they generate electricity from a small uh, water body, isn't it? That technology actually was created by IITNs along with uh, NBA people in a village called Bilgaon in Madhya Pradesh. Okay? So, you can do those kind, we have the technology now to meet many needs using small scale technologies. So, the problem with the Sardar Sarovar project is that it entirely consists of very large projects. Of course, there is also the issue here of large scale, um, um, you know, submersion of land and all of that. That's a different issue here. Yeah, this is the example that I was talking about. Bilgaon is what was shown in the movie Swadesh. So this is, up there is another project which we did in IIT. Hello, uh, some of us from HSS department, uh, civil engineering, uh, Sitara technology alternatives, we all together built a small check dam whose picture you see here. So you can actually do, so, uh, this Konkan area, Raigad is known for very heavy rainfall and yet it doesn't have drinking water for six months in a year which shows a complete lack of imagination and scientific ability among us. If you can harvest that water, you will not need large dams at all. Okay? So there are plenty of technological options which we can talk about without the adverse consequences of these large projects. So I think for students, that is what we must explain. Otherwise, it just seems as though we are anti-technology, we are anti-dam, we are anti-certain kinds of things. We are not anti for this or this, we are for appropriate choices. That's what we are. Okay. Yeah. Sir, another problem with the large uh, dam is the water logging. Mm. So, in the surrounding area, yeah. we are losing the fertile land. Yes. And also, yeah. there is problem for the residents. Yeah. They will live in the unhygienic condition mm. due to dampness, etc., in their houses. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. In fact, one of the issues with the Green Revolution is also that the Indian soil type in most parts is such that it is not suitable for what we call as flooding irrigation, where we flood the field for a long time. Because of that, it has created a lot of soil salinity problems, which causes diseases for plants. So water logging is not really suitable. That kind of uh, irrigation is not suitable for India, which was done through the Green Revolution. And this is the Plachi Mada case. Again, there was an Adivasi tribal organization. Uh, this lady there, Janu, I think, no? CK Janu. If I remember her name correctly, I was the leader of that. So this is related to groundwater uh, depletion, the aquifers, as well as leaching of chemicals because they were using a lot of chemicals to clean the bottles and all of that. So initially they were not able to, uh, uh, the local people were not able to get justice because there was no law. Eventually the Kerala government passed the Groundwater Act through which the panchayats could use that act to deny permission to Coca-Cola. So again, what we are trying to say is that there may be individuals, there may be groups who are for or against certain things, but there needs to be support in the form of institutions, laws, policies to bring about certain kinds of changes. That factory is shut down now. 
So that brings me to the institutional issues, which is again one of the issues in the UGC syllabus. So what I'm, I've tried to do in this presentation is to identify key themes and topics in the UGC syllabus, deal with them in my own way, but touching upon both what is covered in that syllabus, but also developing a larger perspective. So the issue about the institutions, and here I want to pick up on the issue of the commons that Dr. Nikhil mentioned yesterday. Okay. So earlier I mentioned that I have doubts about this role of the individual. Of course, it's important that individuals have to change. Individuals have to transform. That's important. But individuals alone cannot do much because the scale of the problem is very high. Also, for managing resources, whatever kind of resources, forest, water, grassland, oceans, air quality, people have to come together. Okay? There has to be collective action. For that, and so the importance of collective action is that people come together to form institutions. Institutions in social sciences also includes rules and regulations. Rules, regulations, laws, norms, as well as institutions like IIT, Okay, or institutions like organizations, associations, laws are institutions, a regulatory body is an institution, all of these are institutions. So how did human beings develop different kinds of models to prevent degradation, and promote sustainability? So in terms of a solution that you are constantly searching for, the solution could be an institutional solution. So we know certain kinds of models that have failed, but what kind of models have succeeded? So what kind of institutions have people developed that promote sustainability? Have those institutions disappeared? And is that a cause for environmental degradation? Is something we will try to understand in this module. And there, there we will take up the issue of the commons. So yesterday, Dr. Nikhil mentioned about the tragedy of the commons. And some of you explained about this tragedy. So I'm going to focus on the criticism of that tragedy of the commons model. and the alternative that is proposed by people like Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize for her work on the commons. So this is the tragedy of the commons model. There's a cartoon, I don't know if you can read it. Can you read it? The too small, I'll read it. Person on the left says, I'm going to get some cows and take advantage of this free grass too. There's a lot of grass, I'll just increase my herd by 200 head. I could double my income if I double my herd. So because the grazing land or pasture is free, everybody decides to maximize their profits by having more cows. Over a period of time, this degrades. There is no grass available. People have to move out or sell off their cattle and they have nothing to depend on. This is the tragedy of the commons. Only problem is this is not commons. So Gareth Hardin completely misunderstood the idea of commons because Gareth Hardin was interested in promoting private property. He had an ideological motive. He believed that private ownership is the best. So he believed that this way, this is this kind of commons is bad, it will lead to environmental degradation. We should have private ownership because I own the land, I will be interested in sustaining that resource for a long time. But this is not commons, this was never commons. This is open access. So there's a difference between commons and open access. Open access is where everybody accesses a resource like the ocean, like the sea, like the Pawai Lake, uses a resource and allows it to degrade. Commons means that the people using that resource design some rules and regulations about how to manage it, how many cows you can have, how many days can you graze it. If the grass depletes, do you replant grass? Do you do seeding? Do you make sure that people from outside the village don't come and do the grazing? All of that is taken care of in the commons. By the way, going back to that population issue, this. Uh, uh, Gareth Hardin was an extreme right-wing kind of economist. So in the 1970s, he made this very controversial statement. He said, countries like India and China, they will always be poor. Their population is very high. You cannot develop them. The best thing to do is to drop a few atom bombs and kill them off. That is the best thing. He actually said this. Okay, That's why we should not go in for that kind of logic. Okay? Sir, uh, in that paper, Gareth Hardin, you also talked about the river pollution. by. Right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that doesn't bring the uh, uh, picture that just now you said yes. that he proposed uh, private ownership. Yeah. Because if I remember the paper correctly, that in the river upstream and downstream he talked about. 
So even in the in the upstream, if somebody has an industry, and in the downstream, if suppose uh, people are staying there and having agriculture, yeah. and the upstream he pollutes. Yes. So the pollution definitely may not uh, affect him that much. Yes. The way it will affect the downstream. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how here he is talking about private ownership. It's like common, no? That water is common. So, so that precisely that's what he's trying to say. Because it is common, there is no efficient way of managing it. So he says all resources should be privatized so that people take an interest in addressing these kinds of uh, problems where upstream, downstream, there are inequalities or what you do in one area affects another. So he says, if you allow private property, then eventually you will evolve a certain kind of market mechanism where people will acquire different kinds of resources and will devise rules and regulations. That is what is, that's the larger objective of what he's trying to say. Okay. So if you look at this two minute animation uh, documentary there that I've given, that explains both of these perspectives what Gareth Hardin is trying to say and the alternative idea of commons where people actually design rules. So in that they show as opposed to this cartoon that people decide to fence off that these people who decide to obey these rules can only use these commons, this grassland or pasture. There is a limit on how many cows you can graze. There is also a contribution expected from every individual, every household to maintain that pasture. There is also punishment that if you ex violate these rules, what will happen to you? All of that is there. Okay. Or if I can give you an example from Mumbai. So uh, the fishing community in Mumbai, there are what 100,000 of them. We don't realize that. It's not only IIT that is in Mumbai. There are 100,000 fishing, fishing households. Fishing community has an informal customary ban on fishing during the monsoon season because monsoon is when the fish breed, they spawn. If you do fishing during the monsoon, next season there is no fish. But people from outside of Mumbai come to do fishing in the monsoon, you can't do anything about them because they are not part of the commons. Okay? So there is, the local people know how to sustain the resource, they have developed a rule of how to maintain it. So eventually, they of course influence the government of Maharashtra to ban fishing during the monsoon but of course when you give a task to the government, you know it's not going to succeed. It's very easy to flout that rule. So this is the tragedy of the common. So Gareth Hardin says, freedom in a common brings ruin to all because, and if you remember what I just said, he's actually talking of open access regime, not commons. Okay. Here also he's saying, ruin is the destination towards which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. So he's clearly anti-commons. Okay. However, the IASC, which is the worldwide organization for the study and research on commons, it differentiates between different kinds of resource management. These are what are commonly referred to as commons or common property resources or common pool resources because they are not only about ownership. Property indicates ownership, whereas the commons actually is about management. They don't believe in ownership, they are about management. So open access leads to the free rider problem. Everybody is a free rider on the resource. There's overuse, exploitation, there's tragedy, but not commons. What is commons? So Eleanor Ostrom is one of the most famous scholars who worked on the commons. She was a political scientist, but give, was given the Nobel Prize in economics. She's the first woman in economics to get a Nobel Prize. Again, maybe not an accident because she had a different way of looking at the economics of resources. Okay. So here in this interview with her, she talks about what are commons and it is related to what I just said, but she is not a commons fundamentalist. She is not saying commons is the only or best way to govern resources. In some cases, it can be private, in some cases it can be public. So she's talking about multiplicity of governance and ownership arrangements. So for example, when it comes to global warming or climate change, individuals can change their lifestyle. That's not going to make a difference. Governments have to step in and enforce certain norms and regulations for automobiles, for example, bar two, three, four, five, six, whatever, emission norms and all of those. There may be certain kinds of resources which are maintained very well by private sector actors. 
Okay, so Sariska is a case where government fail. Bhopal is a case where the private sector fail. So why not give a chance to others? So she is saying that people develop different kind of institutional arrangements. People are not stupid. That they will allow resources to degrade because it is in their own interest to maintain it. Therefore, people will develop diverse arrangements to prevent the collapse of ecosystems. How do we understand these arrangements? And how do we use that understanding to enhance the uh, sustainability of environments? That is her main objective. So, she says that the nature of human ecosystem interaction is not the same everywhere. It's different from Mumbai to Kalahandi to Kashmir to Singapore. In different places, it's different. It's cultural, it's related to state policy, it's technology, everything, it's economy. There is no unique problem. And here she says, bureaucrats sometimes do not have the correct information, while citizens and users of resources do. Okay, let's not assume that government knows best. Okay, people like you and me and ordinary people also have knowledge. How do we make use of that? Okay, so there's an excellent film which you can show, which ties in all of these issues, which talks about the developmental impact of commons. So it, this film, he's an artist, Amar Kanwar, who made this documentary. He shows that the average benefit to people dependent on the commons in India alone is 5 billion US dollars. And they related to things like farmers' suicides. Because far, drought has been occurring for millions of years. But then when a drought occurred, farmers had an alternative option. They could use their livestock to graze on pasture and get something from that. They could get something from the forest. They could get something from the river, from the lake. Closing off these commons meant those commons which acted as a safety benefit ceased to exist. That is why these kinds of social security problems have emerged, farmers commit suicide. Okay? They also talk about biodiversity here. So, for example, the implications of protecting forests. So, uh, you can get, have a, you can have a lot of medicinal plants in forests, for example. If you destroy the forests, then the chances of discovery of pharmaceutical drugs are less. Okay? That was what one of the justifications for the uh, you know, not giving permission to the Silent Valley project, for example, because it's very rich in biodiversity. Uh, it talks about cultural commons also. Okay, now we talk of digital commons. So, for example, uh, culture can include knowledge, it can include information, it can include music, arts. So, one of the examples they use is the use of common uh, uh, food products for medicinal purposes in India, like turmeric or neem. So they talk about how there are attempts being made to patent the medicinal uses of turmeric and neem in other countries. And therefore, we who have been using them for centuries are forced to pay for those things. They talk about this song from Ham Dil De Chuke Sanam called Nimuda Nimuda Nimuda. You all know that? This is actually a folk song which was written by a Rajasthani Manganiyar folk singer. Okay? Now, this song was taken over by Sanjay Leela Bansali and he, his company has a patent on it. So, the original writer of the song has to pay royalty to Sanjay Leela Bansali to perform his own song. That's the, cult, the destruction of the cultural commons. So, they talk about different kinds of commons in this film and how that has implications for livelihood, for environment, as well as for broader developmental issues. Finally, something very concrete in terms of solutions again. So, Eleanor Ostrom came up with these design principles. So, how to prevent ecosystems from collapsing? Design proper rules. So, she did research among hundreds of commons around the world, including in India, okay, and came up with this set of design principles. She says that most of the successful examples of commons follow these principles. If you can implement these principles, if you can design rules and regulations in this way, environment is less likely to degrade, more likely to be sustained over a long period of time. Okay, and these are easily implementable kind of designs or principles or norms or rules. So I will not 
go into detail on explaining all of these. You can read up all of these and then if you have any doubts, you can write back to me later. But these are things which uh, students generally find very useful in, in class when we talk of what kind of institutional solutions can exist to prevent environmental collapse. Okay. So I'll just end here. We'll have some time for discussion. Just want to end here by saying, reiterating what Professor Fatak was saying. That the idea is that not to just burden you with extra things that you have to teach with which you are not familiar. I know you are all engineers, none of you are social scientists, but I know also from your responses during this two and a half hours, a lot of you think like social scientists, that you have a social conscience, okay, and that you are concerned deeply about social issues. And as Professor Seti mentioned during the break, that you are thinking as a community of environmentalists who are interested in addressing environmental issues in a particular way. So challenge yourselves, get inspired, be passionate. If you want to be passionate, you have to read up things which you don't like, which you're not familiar with. Okay, that's what we do. Every subject that we take up, okay, sometimes there are always some topics, some courses which we just very boring, you have to do it. But what we are trying to say essentially is that you cannot address environmental problems in a narrow way. That has been the thrust of what we've been saying from the beginning in this course. So there are multiple aspects, multiple perspectives to addressing environmental issues. And hopefully putting the problems to the students, posing the problems to the students in these ways will help them not only to understand the issues more clearly, but also enable them to come up with solutions better. So I was thinking of calling a few students here today, but they were not free. There are three students who did our environment studies course last year. They started a project in a rural area for sanitation, inspired by our course. Another student who passed out two years ago, he started a waste management enterprise. Okay, so uh, hopefully uh, your own course will also touch people's lives in that way, because this is what I like to call as an impact course. All courses have an impact. Okay, they do things for students in their later lives. But this impacts us as persons, as human beings, as individuals. And if you can do that as coordinators, as teachers, and if you can, you know, in turn, guide your own teachers to touch other students' lives, then I think it would have been worth it. Okay? So I'll stop here. Uh, before I take questions on any of these topics, one thing I want to reiterate, which I mentioned in the beginning, that you are coordinators and what I have done is to select topics from the UGC syllabus and pose the issues in a particular way. And the handouts that you have been given there, those contain questions, some of which I have touched upon here, some of which I have not for lack of time. So as coordinators and as teachers, I would like you to think about how you can relate each of those questions to the topics from the UGC syllabus which I've picked up. I have also given in parentheses or brackets some examples of themes, topics, case studies which you can use with reference to those questions. So I don't expect that you will read that and immediately you know, find out ways in which you can use them in your classroom. Please go through them today, next three days, next two months. But my own suggestion is that this will uh, uh, amplify the message that we want to send out to students about the environment instead of simply following the textbook in that way. So the topics are important as given in the textbooks in the UGC syllabus, but the method of dealing with those topics is quite outmoded. So I would ask you to challenge yourselves and the students by raising those sorts of questions. Okay? So that we reflect more and it doesn't just become an issue of you know, uh, rote learning whatever you taught in the classroom and through guidebooks and then regurgitating them in the exams. Okay? Yeah. So any questions about anything? Welcome. So, good evening all. Yeah, I can, we can hear you. Yeah. I am from uh, Gitam University, Hyderabad campus. Uh, Venkata Nagendra Kumar. So it is my observation, environmental chemistry or studies, as I am from chemistry, it's coming chemistry, environmental studies, uh, we are teaching for engineering graduates. 
particularly engineering graduates, they will listen to the teacher in the classroom. Then after the once the semester ends, mm. they would. I'm sorry to say this, and this is my observation. They don't have any little bit concern in the environment. But what I observed, I visited many schools, children. I addressed the children. Say second, third class, fourth class, sixth class people. They are having lot concern in the environment. And once we encourage them, they are ready to uh, whatever activity we will give. They are taking it granted, and they are doing without any uh, say expecting nothing. So school, that is my observation. Particularly, though we are putting this much efforts in the yes, engineering yes. graduates, mm. they are not having a, mm. for that what you have to do. Okay. This is one of the yeah. observations. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Thank you for that observation. In fact, you know, it's not very uh, different in IIT as well. So most of the students do it because they have to do it. But then what we find is that over the years, our own ability to teach this has improved. And the choice of topics has been transformed in response to what we think will make better sense to students. And of course, our teaching ability has improved. Uh, and as a response to that, we find the number of students who take this course seriously is increasing. More importantly, you know, in a course of this kind, you can never expect that 100% uh, will take to this course. And our objective is not to make all the students into environmental scientists. Our objective is to see how in small ways they can incorporate the learnings from this into whatever they will do later. So we are finding increasingly there are few students who take it very seriously and turn it into careers. But we also see there are other students who will incorporate this in small ways into whatever they are doing. For example, last year I had a student from civil engineering and he went and fought with his professors because he was given a BTIC project on uh, something to do with uh, high rises or stadiums or something. He said, I want to do low cost housing and nobody was willing to guide me on that. Low cost housing, green housing, you know, low carbon housing and all that. So he came and talked to me. He said, you please talk to my professors and uh, make sure someone guides me. I said, no, don't get me into trouble with my own colleagues. But <laughs> and on his own, you know, there was this controversy going on around Lavasa, that uh, big township uh, in, in, in near Pune. So on his own, he went. He did his own environmental assessment, he came up with a beautiful paper. Okay? So there are these kind of things which encourages. So over a period we hope that there, this number will expand. Even if it is 10% or 20%, it is worth doing it. It will make a difference, I think. This is Pavitra. I am from Sri Mata Vasanam Devi University, Katra. Mm -hmm. Actually, my uh, question is actually related to policy issue. Actually, generally, we all academics and we talk uh, actually so many big things and policy, all these things. But in practice, actually, we don't actually uh, implement it. Like, mm -hmm. we, we talk about environmental issue, but none of us that we don't plant that tree because at one, two, or five trees we should plant. Or I think some, so somewhere that there should be a, a rule from the government that if that these are serious issues that government should make the rule, I, at least a teacher or or somebody that, or environmentalist or somebody who are working in government sector they should come forward and they should the plant trees because uh, people who lot of people they are degrading and they are polluting but people who are actually they have some sense of. A sense to add environment, they should do that. Yeah. And the second issue is that we are talking about also environmental issue that people they have a three car, four car, five car, something like that. We should have some ceiling or government have some rule that you can you can cap uh, buy more than two cars, something like that. And that in some some way it will help uh, to actually damage um, okay. yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So those uh, see there is. Just one response that I can have. Of course, the second issue, there are uh, many countries are trying out different mechanisms. Singapore, for example, has something called COE, uh, Certificate of Entitlement. So people have, suppose a car is $10,000, you have to pay $100,000 to buy a car to get that certificate. Okay, and there are limited number of certificates of entitlement, even to buy a motorbike. So, or in um, Britain, London, for example, certain license, uh, cars with uh, different kinds of license number plates can only come into London city on particular days, odd days, even days and so on. These are being tried out. So uh, that's for the government to do. But on the first issue that you mentioned, what government should do, say increasingly we have moved away from government to governance. So we believe the job of government is not only that of the government. The job of governance is of everybody in a democracy. 
Okay, so everybody has a responsibility. So communities, groups, associations, businesses, all of them have to contribute to the maintenance of laws, to the enactment of laws, to implementing laws. So that's what Professor Fatak was saying yesterday. He says, why do people not follow traffic rules? Okay, so we know it is wrong, but we still go ahead and do it. So governance is not simply about saying that the government should do this because we know it doesn't happen. Okay, so how to enhance governance? That is the making of decisions and the implementation of decisions. What kind of exercises does it involve? What kind of decision making does it involve? What kind of participation does it involve? And that's why you know the commons model makes a lot of sense because it is probably the most democratic process of decision making and implementing decisions. And we find, and at least Ostrom's work for which she was awarded the Nobel Prize shows it works. So I think we have to move away from that model of top-down approach where the government does everything to how we can facilitate. So government can enact laws, but it is up to the people to put pressure and make sure it works and also follow those rules. Okay. I want to raise one topic which is uh, probably quite relevant to this discussion. Uh, conformity to the environmental rules, industry, environment and employment. How do you correlate? Employment, industry and yeah. environment. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because often there is a self-conflict. Yeah. I have seen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's in fact one of the dilemmas that the government also f uh, faces in terms of, you know, conflict between multiple objectives of employment generation, industrial activity, and environment. So, in, in, in terms of yes. So while conforming to all the rules and regulations. So very often. Many people, even educated people will say that employment is more important or industry is more important. We can ignore environment for a little time and so on. So this is the you know, classic environment versus development kind of debate. And we know it doesn't work this way because ignoring the environment even for a short term can cause disaster. So you know, a lot of uh, activities have been situated along coastal areas in Mumbai, which was one of the reasons for the flooding that we experience all the time because what happens is Many of the flood barriers like salt pan and mangroves and so on were destroyed. Uh, let's take the issue face by face, face to face actually. Suppose in an industry, it is not conforming to the environmental rules and the uh, people who are taking care of the environmental rules, I mean the pollution control board people, they are going to there and they are going to put some closer notice. Yeah. And immediately the trade union leaders are coming up and they are telling, are you giving me my bread? who has given you the right to yes. close the company. Yeah. Yes. How are you addressing this problem? Yeah. Because these budding engineers, they are yeah. going to be yeah. inducted mostly in yeah. the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, passing out from the college. Yeah. No, it's, it's a valid point. In fact, there have been... So that's a conflict of interest actually. Exactly. They're getting from the yes. institute and what they are getting yeah. in the industry. Yeah. It's a direct conflict. Yeah. Exactly. No, I mean, there is actually a very interesting article on Delhi because uh, some years ago there was a judgment asking all industries in Delhi to shift out of Delhi and there were huge protests by the trade unions. So what we are saying is, it's not a question of employment vis-a-vis -vis environment. There are solutions which you can work out, which manage both kinds of needs. So we need to work on them. Yeah. Uh, one last question here. Activity which I am carried out here in my institute. Okay. So that experience I want to share with all. Uh, myself, Professor R.S. Patel, Decatur Engineering College, Textile and Engineering College, Itzal Kranji, Kolhapur District. So what I am doing, uh, some uh, barren lands are available here in our institute. So every year we are uh, given admission up to 550 students okay, in our institute. And I am particularly teach here in second year. So what activities I am carried out for to make as a role of individual okay, uh, about the afforestation. Every year we are going to plant only seven pl pl trees there in our campus. Okay. And in one class 70 students are there, seven zero. Okay. And, uh, we are, uh, that plant we are given through the institution and uh, in three years from second year to final year so they will take all the maintenance and all these things are there mm -hmm. okay so at the time of alumni meet okay when they have seen that particular tree or the plants so they will also make uh, they are going to happy that our plant is still live in our area or campus so every year only we are going to plant seven trees each from each and every branch now the total area, it's looking like it's a green belt now uh, in this uh, 10 years. Okay. Okay, so it will also help. Yeah. 
yes. to other institutes which are having the barren lands. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. But we also have you know, every batch has a, something called a legacy project. One of the legacy projects is a park, which an alumni group uh, paid for and got got uh, constructed here. It's called the Shitij Park, which you can see on campus. Thank you very much for all your feedback.